So Iron Designer here. Just wanted to put this video out. Mainly it's going to talk about clamp load and proof load for bolted connections. And primarily it's going to get into calculating the bolt torque. So stay tuned. It won't be a very long video, but I think it'll be very informative. So I just wanted to remind everybody about the other videos on the Iron Designer channel. I uh, just wanted to go over that really quick. We've got How Weldments Fail. That's a very good video. Uh, working with uh, Lincoln Arc Welding textbook. How Bolt Patterns Fail. Per Chart Analysis, Web Scraping. I've got videos on CSV and SQL. Calculations on centrifugal energy, kinetics, number analysis, mechanical engineering stress and kinetic energy analysis, learning to interview, reverse engineering, numerical analysis, safety designs, starting your business, all the way on through to robotics and smart machines. Now, I've had a full career in engineering. I've been in engineering since 1989. Retired approximately 2018. That's a pretty long career. And when I first got in engineering right out of college, I had an extremely good mentor, an extremely good engineering manager. I worked for a great company. They taught me a lot. But over the next three decades, I learned a lot more on my own going from one company to another, working as a consultant, a contract engineer, back to permanent, and so on throughout my career. And one of the things that I deeply remembered was that as a young engineer, you're going to come across all sorts of published data and publications. And the problem with this published data and published engineering information is that many of the time it is just copied from and then flourishes out into many sources and the same errors are copied through dozens of companies, dozens of publications, dozens of marketing materials and free brochures and sales information and what. And what I do when I mentor younger engineers is I try to explain to them that they can't just simply look at a table such as what you see here without fully understanding exactly what they're looking at and they need to go a little bit deeper and do a deep dive and analysis and that's why many of my videos are done in Microsoft Excel and I don't use PowerPoint because in Excel off to the side I could do little calculations off in the margins to verify what we used to call a reality check or a sanity check on our numbers and I'm trying to emphasize the same thing here so I'm going to go back to the same bolt that I always pick on in all my videos which is the quarter 20 bolt it's a coarse thread American bolt and in this chart, um, I also pick on grade 2 because 0, 1, 2, they're all really the same grade. And you could buy these at Home Depot. I've done other videos showing that. They show that it has a 74,000 PSI tensile strength and that you're supposed to torque that bolt to 6 foot-pounds. All right, it says dry. So without any lubricant on the threads or the nut, you can torque it up to six foot-pounds. So what I want to do in this video is take a look and see, according to a sanity check, if that is appropriate or inappropriate for the engineer to proceed in that direction. Now before we jump to the next slide, I just wanted to mention this right here. 
the least material condition or you might see it on an engineering drawing as LMC or as most of the time you'll see it on the engineering drawing as MMC which is maximum material condition so for now I'm not necessarily going to explain that term but just keep keep these words in the back of your mind we're going to mention them in the slides down the road so typically um, the way I like to design things is I like to make a through connection which means I don't just want to run a, a thread tap in the base metal and just tighten my screw into the base material because then you get in all sorts of headaches with the thread quality and the depth of the thread and whether the thread is blind or passes all the way through if I could design a connection what I like to do is just simply drill a hole drop the bolt through there put the nut on the other end and then torque it this way I know that the nut has been made in a factory by a machine it's not been just threads machined into the base metal by a machinist which you know could have all kinds of variability so in this case the type of nut that I use is this type of nut right here that has um, you know it's been finished on both sides see this is square on one side finished on the other so what I like to do is use these machine screws that are finished on both sides they're very nicely cleaned up there's no debris inside the uh, threads it's all been cleaned out by by the factory and whatnot the purpose of this um, slide right here is this little pink bar right here I try to do it a little bit transparent we're, we're back here at the quarter inch so we're at the quarter 20 that's the row for that and right here is letter H so what I'm interested in is knowing how many threads are across here from letter H okay and you always want to be conservative so in this case you go to minimum so that means that H is minimum thickness and it tells me that the height of this um, nut right here is 0.178 inches in height letter H okay so from the previous slide we saw that the number of um, the number of threads per inch is 20 of them okay and looking at the nut you only have 0.178 inches thickness in here so if you take um, 20 times 0.178 you're gonna get approximately 3.6 threads per H okay not per inch but per H okay you have 20 per inch but in the height of this nut you're gonna have 3.6 threads so as an engineer you want to be conservative and you could use the entire number 3.6 as the number of threads so you have three complete threads that go all the way around one two three and then you have six tenths of a thread so that would be um, a little bit more than half right like halfway would have been a 0.5 and if you went 0.6 you're about six tenths of the way around the circumference of the inside okay so that's what I wanted to address to you in this particular slide so in this slide again going back to what I said originally you know there's all kinds of published material and publications out there and um, in this slide you're looking at several different um, grades of bolts and nuts so here for example you have a uh, grade 5 which typically I, I only design for grade 2 if I use better quality hardware then I just specify the better quality hardware but my calculations are always based on the worst condition and I try to get the most conservative numbers so 
even though I'm showing you grade five, it's just because I couldn't find a chart on grade two. But this one here is just showing you kind of like with a, ni a nylon insert um, nut, which I use all the time, even in my like personal projects. And it shows you here that the quarter 20 could have a clamping force of 2,000 pounds. And remember, clamp force is like 75% of proof, okay? So if you have proof force and you times it by 0.75, that's clamping force, okay? Here they're showing you the lubricants that they're putting on the, um, on the screw, the machine screw and the nut. So Loctite would be kind of like a glue. The blue is separable. The red is not separable. And the copper anti-seize is like an uh, anti-corrosion lubricant. So in this case, they're saying that a grade five with the anti-seize, you require a torque or can apply a torque of eight foot-pounds. Over here, you can um, look at this uh, kind of zinc-plated nut, which is probably more like what, what we would use in a... Um, in our applications, you have again the quarter 20, 2,000 pounds, and um, when it's lubricated, it shows you eight foot pounds. If you look, continue on, and you say you have a quarter 20 made from 18.8 stainless steel, which is similar to 304 um, type of stainless steel, like say your, your, uh, your forks and spoons and things at your home, they're probably made out of 304 or 18.8 type stainless steel and they're stamped out. But you could also make hardware out of it. And here again, the quarter 20, you have um, a smaller clamp force, only 1400 pounds now because it's changed the material from a steel to a stainless steel. But yet, now they're using a nickel anti-seize because it's a stainless rather than a copper anti-seize because it was a steel, like a zinc-plated, cadmium-plated steel. So they're still telling you to torque it to the same 8 foot-pounds, all right? So you can change the parameters around and still, you know, get the same torque values. But again, when I'm training uh, engineers... Um, I tell them to be aware of this and be cautious of it. So here again, you have hardware made out of 316 stainless steel, quarter 20, 1400 uh, pounds clamp force, which is, again, kind of strange because I'll show you later on, 18.8 stainless has a completely different um, proof strength than 316 does. Actually, 3 sixteenths is slightly uh, weaker than 18.8. Yet, it looks like the clamp forces are the same, even though the materials have changed. All right? And then, even now, the lubricants are the same, but the torques are the same. So, you have differences in material, changes in nylock um, or plane, which is impossible because a plain nut is going to torque a lot smoother than one with a nylon insert is going to torque because that's the whole purpose of having the nylon insert is to add additional friction to the threads to keep the nut from spinning backwards and spinning out under vibration. So that's why I say you need to really take a look at these things. Um, you know, here they're saying that nylon and plain are the same um, torque with um, you know different types of nuts so be aware of that I'm just trying to show you an example these are good for ballparking but if you're really doing a critical analysis you're gonna have to really pay very close attention to the published data So I just wanted to give you another little snippet of a, a chart and a table. And going back to the grade two, 
Um, again, we're at the quarter 20, even though, you know, there's like typos here. They didn't put a slash. They put a one sometimes instead of a slash in the table. But here what they're doing now, they're, they're trying to publish that 75% um, of the yield is at 43,000 PSI. And we're just going to look here at the plane. So now you can see here's a different reference chart remember before that you know where they had the lubricant like the copper anti-seize or the the nickel anti-seize i'm assuming that waxed is similar to these anti-seize um lubricants with uh metals inside of them for anti-corrosion and we're, we're going to ignore the the zinc plate for now and all these different grades but again like i i said I usually do my calculations based on grade two because, of course, if it's going to pass grade two and I call in the engineering drawing for grade five or grade eight, I mean, you can see 69,000, 98,000, you know, compared to 43,000. But you know very well that if it's going to work with grade two, it's going to easily work with any of these others but imagine if you did your analysis with grade eight and you had a very sloppy retrofit or somebody wasn't checking the um the bolts that they were putting into your design and use grade two and you only had say like four grade eights but you know you would need like i mean even if you had double these um, I mean, these are each one of these is less than half of one of these because this would be 86,000 PSI, even if you doubled it. And here, you, you wouldn't even be able, even with two of these, you wouldn't even get to one of those because here it's at 98,000. So that's why it's, it's really critical to do your calculations on the most conservative um, numbers and then specify you know, greater quality, greater strength in your design. But at least you've got safety of knowing that even in the worst condition, you've got um, a passing assembly. So here, um, this number, I checked the 0 0.0318, which is the tensile stress area. So this is the area in the bolt down in the root of the threads where all the tension is occurring even though the load is being applied to the thread but you have the area at the root of the threads and that's 0 0.0318 and i found that that came out of one of shigley's tables even though in his textbook which i use all the time the 10th edition he says that it's from the uniform um screw tables which is like ANSI or ASME, um, but then I've, I'll show you that I found some discrepancies there as well. So all I've done here is just showing you the um, this graph that the strengths, the PSIs are going from 43 to 55, which is the number called out by um, like the bold data sheet, I think somewhere. If you take 75% of 74 you'll get 55,000 and um so that's where i got that number and then the 573 is the 75 percent of the yield strength for the material so you either have to look at the computed yield which means that you are dividing the numbers by the area so if you take the 74,000 that we saw in the other chart and you divide by this area then you're computing a different yield strength than the computed proof strength so that's another caution to take a look so that's why i listed that number here in the chart and then the full-on tensile strength which i'm assuming comes from like an actual pull test where they um, uh, pull the bolt until it um, tears apart. What I have down on the side here 
is uh, a little table here computing the assumed tensile diameters. Um, and again, these are the diameters from the areas. So these are area and these are diameters. And this is the assumed OD, which again, I talked to you about least material condition. Not always is the outside diameter of the threads going to be quarter inch like the shank. And I'll show you a picture in the next slide, the difference between the top of the thread peaks and the outside diameter of the shank. And then this is the assumed pitch diameters, which that is the line at which the tensile load is applied between the nut and the machine screw. And um, again, the assumed pitch width is half of each thread. So if you take 20, one inch divided by 20, because there are 20 threads per inch, then the width of each thread um, that's, that's actually holding the load is only half of each thread um, peak because the threads are at an angle. They're not like little square blocks. They're tapered like helixes. So that's why you can only assume half. And I'll show you that in the next slide. And then you have the helical shear area, which would be the area of shear at the pitch diameter um, per each thread. So this is the helical shear area per thread at the assumed pitch diameter or pitch radius. And then these are just um, arbitrarily looking at the failure load per um, thread at tensile. So I'll take you to the next slide. And um, here I'm just showing you that other, other um, publications are showing that you generally torque to 65% of proof. And you saw in the other um, chart, it was 75% of proof. And uh, here other sources are talking about 80% of proof. So every engineer needs to make their own decisions. And this is taken out of Roymec from 2009. So um, we need to look at these things very carefully because when we make our assumptions for our designs, we have to be able to back up our assumptions with some sort of mathematics or some sort of empirical testing in the laboratory and we need to collect the data. So even if we collect empirical data in the lab, then we have to validate that our machine was calibrated. So either way that we go about this, we need to approach it uh, using a great deal of logic. So if you remember the intro slide, it was showing you that I was using the 27th edition of the Machinery's Handbook for some of the data and potentially some of the Machinery's Handbook Pocket Companion, all right? Um, but as I've been going through this video, I was kind of lying to you so far because mostly I was pulling numbers out of Shigley's 10th edition. So you should be saying, hey, Iron Designer, um, why are you kind of going back and forth? And the reason is very good. It's because this is a very popular textbook by Shigley, and there's nothing wrong with it at all. I've used this for 30 years. Likewise, the Machinery's Handbook probably goes back 100 years, and there's nothing wrong with the machinery's handbook either. I've used that for 30 years. As you can see, it's been edited 27 times. Well, how come they don't match at this point? I mean, after 100 years, don't you think that the threads would all be the same and all the data would be the same and all the calculations would be the same? I mean, that would make logical sense if engineers been working on it for a hundred years they would just have one bible for fasteners but there isn't one and that's why i'm kind of showing you not only these two extremely worldwide powerful books 
but I'm showing you there's even additional booklets, information, sales brochures, and marketing data, and all this um, that either promote one or the other, and they don't know which one is correct. They don't know which one is right, and that's why the engineer needs to be able to back that data up, and you don't want to just simply make a bad design and then put a safety factor of 20 on it, you know, I mean, most aerospace designs have safety factor of like 1.1, you know, and other engineering designs maybe have safety factor of two or three. And some of the things I work on at Iron Designer might have a safety factor of six or seven, but you don't want to get so out of, out of the uh, actual data that you need to apply a safety factor of 10, 12, 15, or 20 just to be absolutely certain that it won't fail. So that's why we're going through this analysis. And what I have here is just showing you, say for example, you had a bracket or something that looked like this. It was bolted to something and you're pulling, you know, on this part of the bracket and here's the fasteners trying to hold everything down, okay? Um, yes, possibly the middle might lift up and now we have additional stress on the bolts called peel but let's just for now just look at it from clamp load okay keep it simple so here I have a picture of uh, a screw it just shows you the different nomenclatures of the screw and here's the shank now the shank might actually be the nominal value so if you talk about a quarter inch bolt then maybe the shank is exactly 0.25 but the height of the threads, because they're being machined, the, the metal is being removed and the, the outside diameter of the tip of the thread is probably going to be smaller than the actual diameter of the shank, which was not touched. Okay. And here's our 20 threads per inch. Okay. What I've done in this picture here is I just zoomed in on this little red box. I just zoomed it up for you. And I'm showing you this red line cuts across these little peaks here, and that's called the pitch line. So at that intersection line, the nut is acting in the valleys of these little peaks, and that's where you're creating your clamp load. By when you apply the torque to the screw, then you're generating the load up against all these faces, up against the whole helix in three dimensions okay i've drawn this little cartoon here to try to illustrate that a little bit better so you have the peaks from the helical threads and then the 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 peak in in the opposite direction so one's called internal one's called external you have the pressure along the face being applied every pitch so you're pitching from this face to that face that would be one pitch or you can pitch from that peak to that peak that would be one pitch okay and when you say 20 then you have 20 of these peaks every inch you have 20 pressure faces along here every inch if you cut it down the middle like a cross section okay so you have the nut pitch and you have the bolt pitch and the reason why in the previous slide you have to cut the value in half to the 25, like I've shown here, the bolt metal, is that even though the width of the pitch is going to be 1 divided by 20 in this case, but the amount of metal that is actually supporting the opposing face is only going to be half as wide, approximately, half as wide as the, you could do the trigonometry and actually calculate the angles, but just roughly speaking, half as much as the pitch. So you're not going from pressure face all the way to pressure face. You're only, you're only going to shear half the distance. So that's why you take the spacing between the pitches and divide it by half. Here again, I'm using the Shigley number for the stress area, which would be 
along the root value. So from that root to that root, the area of that would be that number according to Shigley. And some of these numbers we've talked about, I don't want to really beat them to death. And here again, I'm just showing you the threads in the nut that we looked at previously. So we're going to go to the next slide and we're going to look at another spreadsheet um, that computes torques and it's computing its values of torque from the references in the machinery handbook. So we're just going to pick this back up over here where I was showing you the Shigley um, cover of the book. And I'm bringing you back here again because what I've got here are the snippets from the machinery handbook. So that's why I said, you know, the engineer really needs to make sure that he is... Um, looking and addressing all the data so things like the nominal diameters the tension diameters all the dimensions of the the way the screw is machined is coming out of the machinery's handbook and we're using the 27th edition here so another thing that's also in the machinery handbook is you saw earlier on they were talking about lubricants and coefficient of friction of those lubricants and, you know, you can see some graphite is like 0.07. So these are the friction factors or the thing they call mu in uh, machine design. And remember, the mu is along the pressure face. So if you have just plain, then you have just metal on metal. If you have lubricant, then you have some lubricity, you know, there. They talked about wax in the earlier slide, but here they have other things like machine oil that has that friction value, 0.15. They have um, cadmium plate, which is actually smoother than machine oil. See, the mu is smaller, right? Or you could put petroleum, like, you know, Vaseline, right? Or oil, or molybdenum diluted in grease. You know, or you could have zinc, you know, zinc coating. You could have um, steel on bronze. So you have dissimilar metals. You have, you know, corrosion resistant nickel or copper or titanium and steel or just titanium on titanium with molybdenum, you know, um, grease. So that, that's just uh, interesting different products that are available for the engineer to reduce friction over here on the left in the um, in the machinery handbook it's talking about the tensile strain strengths and the proof load so if you look here at the grade two because that's where we you know play ball is um, up to three quarter of an inch the proof load is 55,000 psi and 74,000 psi but then once you get at seven eighths up to inch and a half in grade two, they only go up to inch and a half. They lower down the proof and the tensile. So be aware of that. The reason is because as the metal is cooling down, the core of the steel, the aggregates in the core of the steel are not going to be as strong as the strength in the skin of the bolt. So when the bolt shank is smaller diameter like three quarter and below you have a more homogeneous and uniform molecular structure in the in the steel called the aggregate and so you get a higher proof strength and a higher tensile strength so as soon as you get seven eighths and above there's a sharp decline in the aggregate strength so continuing on down I just did little snippets here for ed education of this video. You can see the 27 edition is already like 20 years old, you know. So it's not a not a new book. But um, I'm going to um, try to zoom in here a little bit uh, to get you a little closer to this. And um, let's see if we can get a little closer here. 
So, um, I'm taking you here to table three of the uni unified screw threads table. And here we got our quarter 20 in the uh, machinery handbook 27 edition table three and you've got internal threads and external threads so this would be like the nut and this would be like the um, the screw itself and here's the values now what you want to try to do to be conservative is use the 1a 1b um values because those are going to be the most sloppy um thread values and i'm not going to go over each one of these you could just try to look this up yourself but as you get to the 2A and the 3A, 3A is nearly perfect. So a 3A screw and a 3B nut would be almost like perfection. There's no loss in diameter. There's no change in pitch. All those things remain the same. So that's what we were talking about here. And some of the numbers come from those tables. And what I want to do is just get into this... Uh, last uh, of the spreadsheets and I acquired this spreadsheet from another engineer maybe two decades ago and what they've done here is they have a couple knockdown factors it's not that important the structure of the spreadsheet but I'll, I'll show you the data table down here and what they've done is they're knocking down the yield strength um, to 93% of yield so this is going to be the, the proof stress, the ultimate proof stress value. And then they're taking 75% of the, um, the area in order to compute the, um, uh, the, the, proof, the final proof strength so they can compute the clamp load. So because um, what you need to do is you've got the uh, proof clamp, but you don't want to go all the way to the proof clamp you want to go to just the clamp load, which is at 75% of the proof clamp. And what they've, what they've done here, it's kind of interesting. You can change this number and it, it, it looks in this little index here and picks up the various values and assigns those values into the stress analysis. But what I'm going to show you here is that when you go down into this table, at the quarter inch bolt, you've got the 2367 and 2106 diameter values. Those are the nominal diameter and the uh, tensile diameters. So if you went back into this, um, into this chart here, you would see that for the 2A, you would, you would pick up those values in, in this chart here. The 2367 is right here, which is what I was showing you here as the nominal diameter. And so there's 2367. It's called the external major diameter minimum value. So that's the external major diameter, the peak of the threads, but the minimal value. So you're getting the least amount of material condition like I explained in the first couple slides and then here in the pitch diameter under the minimum value for the the 1a which is the worst um condition of the machine screw you have the 0 0.2108 under pitch diameter minimum so we can see that that's the values that are being picked up here and those values get um translated up into the table for the computation and then it ultimately gives you the bolt torque and it could give it to you in foot pounds or inch pounds so that's really you know you can construct your own table like this with indexes and things here it's showing you also the um the clamp load so in the same row as the quarter inch UNC, which is the quarter 20, you get the clamp load calculation and it's showing you a formula for how that is obtained. So it's a really nice table. You should design a table like this for yourself using the values in either machinery handbook 
or I have over here to the right the values from Shigley. Um, basically, basically doing the same thing. Um, you can choose your own method of how you want to do this. This is table 8-2 in Shigley's 10th edition. And again, you would look here at the quarter inch row and you have 20 threads per inch. Here's the 0 0.0318 value for the tensile area. And here is the minor diameter area 0 0.0269. And th these columns here are for the fine thread. So typically you want to maybe focus on the coarse threads. But um, so that's how they get these two different values here. And that's basically what you're looking at. The here, what the tension area here that's calculated using machinery handbook is 0 0.0349. And using Shigley, he already did the calculation for us and it's 0 0.0318. So you see he's got a slightly smaller, more conservative tensile area in his book than in the um, machinery's handbook. So they have a slightly larger um, value here. That's where the safety factors come into play. And possibly that's why the author of this table uh, has a 93% um, on the knockdown factor for his computations, um, even though his clamp load is still coming out the same number. So he's doing it through a knockdown factor. Shigley is doing it through changes in the tensile areas. So I just wanted to go over that with you. The rest of this uh, table here, this chart, is just basically looking at other uh just continuing on with this table three it's a very long table and it just goes all the way up to the inch and a half um screw sizes and pretty much ends at at that point so i just want to go over that with you i did do a little side notation here um just to, for my own sanity check and this is really important for the engineers to always do these little um, tables here for sanity check I just was taking the diameter values from machinery handbook and computing them into areas so for all the diameters whether it's a 1a 2a 3a or 1b 2b 3b all the diameters in the tables since they're just listed as diameters where Shigley has areas, I was converting them into areas and double checking that, yes, in the other spreadsheet, the computation does match the 0 0.0349 exactly the way that it's computed there. And you can also work backwards and compute out the... Um, the diameters from the areas in Shigley's uh, textbook. So, you know, a good engineer would try to look at things both ways. So this is Iron Designer saying, uh, we're gonna be done with this video and we'll see you on the next video. Please remember to share, like, and subscribe and comment down below if you have additional ideas for videos you'd like to see if i could do them i'm not sure but i'll give it a shot and post your question down below in the comments section thank you